Hello and welcome to College Physics 1, Lecture 3, Significant Figures and Scientific Notation. Physics attempts to explain the natural world from the very small to the exceedingly large. And in order for us to understand our world, we need to be able to measure quantities both minuscule and enormous. We can measure our quantity with only a certain precision, however. To make this precision clear, we need to make sure that we report our measurements with the correct number of significant figures. Writing down the really big and small numbers that often come up in physics can also be awkward and cumbersome. To avoid writing all of the zeros involved with those big and small numbers, scientists often use scientific notation to express numbers both big and small. When we measure any quantity, we can do so only with a certain precision. If the quantity is measured by a single instrument, its precision depends on the instrument used to measure it. If you make a measurement with a ruler, for example, as we have on the top right, you probably can't be more accurate than plus or minus 0.1, or excuse me, plus or minus 1 millimeter because the smallest divisions on a ruler such as the one shown is a millimeter. So you might be able to guess, you know, how far in between each little line it is, but you don't know for sure. However, something like a caliper can be more precise. It can maybe go down to 0.01 millimeters. So it's uh, a factor of a hundred times more precise, perhaps. And so, the precision there depends on your device. Both things, a ruler and a caliper, measure length, but one is more precise than the other. However, the precision of a number uh, can also be affected by the skill or judgment of the user performing the experiment or measurement. Um, for example, even with something as simple as a ruler, you might not be as precise as you might think. So sure, the ruler itself has a precision of about one millimeter, but maybe you're viewing the ruler from an angle. Maybe you're off to the side of it and looking at an angle. And so your perception of what line you're actually looking at could be skewed because of that. Additionally, um, perhaps the user is using a stopwatch. The stopwatch might have a precision all the way down to 0.001 seconds. But due to your reaction time, your measurement of this time of, say, a sprinter would actually be much less precise than that. So how do we express our precision when we write a number? Well, in this case, we invoke the use of significant figures. So when we write numbers, we have to convey our precision. So the way we do this is through significant figures, which are the digits in a number that are reliably known. So, I mean, what does that mean? Let's go ahead and jump right into an example. Let's say in an experiment, something is found to be 6.2 centimeters in length. Well, if you later told another scientist, perhaps, that uh, the length was 6 centimeters. Okay, well, it's around 6 centimeters, sure, but you know it to be 6.2. So you're actually telling the person less information than you know. In other words, you aren't being as precise as you actually were. But maybe, uh, you know, you forget the number and you tell a different person that it was, uh, you know, 6.213 centimeters. Well, in this case, you're telling them a precision down to the third decimal place, which means you're claiming to have more information than you actually possess, because you only knew it to be 6.2 centimeters. So, um, in this case, you're not being accurate or precise. So the number of significant figures are those that are reliably known. In the case of the original number, that's the 6 and the 2. We don't reliably know that there's a 1 and a 3 here. So what we're going to do is take a look at some of the rules for determining the number of sig figs in a number. So to begin, let's just start with the simple, uh, simplest rule of them all. All non-zero numbers are considered significant. So as a random number I just threw out here, 36.8. All of those are non-zero numbers, so all of those are significant. In other words, the number 36.8 has three significant figures, or uh, shorthand sig figs. 
leading zeros. Leading zeros are any zeros that come before the first non-zero number. So any zeros that come at the beginning of a number, whether they're to the left or the right of a decimal place or both, are not significant. So if I pick a random number, 0 0.046, those are both leading zeros out front, so they're not significant, but the non-zero 4 and 6 are. So in total, 0 0.046 has two sig figs. All right, in between zeros that are zeros that fall between two non-zero numbers are always considered significant. So if we have the number 2019, the zero there is in between non-zero digits, so it is significant along with everything else. In other words, all four numbers or digits in 2019 are significant, so it has four significant figures. Okay, then we get to trailing zeros, which has kind of a, a, a branching path here for what your options are. Let's start with trailing zeros that are to the right of a decimal place. Any zeros that are trailing after a decimal place or to the right of the decimal place are considered to be significant. So in the case of the number, say, 18.00, those trailing zeros are after the decimal place, which means they are significant. So all four digits are significant in 18.00, giving us a total of four sig figs. Okay, well, what if your zero is to the left of a decimal place? Well, if the decimal place is shown, the zero is still considered to be significant. So if we wrote 240 point, it seems weird to write that because you don't normally see it that way, but if we write 240 with a decimal place, all of those values are considered significant. That trailing zero still counts. But there is a case when the trailing zeros aren't significant, and that is when you have a whole number without a decimal place given. If there is no decimal place shown, we assume that that zero is not significant, because the person could have been rounding, for example. So maybe it was, you know, 239.8 or something. Well, perhaps they rounded up. We don't really know. That decimal place really tells us if we have precision in that place or not. So, if you have a trailing zero without a decimal place shown, it is not significant. So, the number 240 now only has two sig figs, whereas earlier it had three when there was a decimal place shown. So, be careful. The trailing zeros can get a little bit tricky when counting sig figs. Okay, let's look at two additional rules. These come about when we do mathematical operations. Uh, so we'll start with addition and subtraction. So whenever you add or subtract two numbers and you want to count the proper sig figs, the way we go about this is your answer should have the same number of decimal places as there are in the number with the fewest amount of decimal places. Now admittedly that is a mouthful, so let's go right into an example to visualize what we've just said. So we're saying again that your answer should have the same number of decimal places as the number with the fewest. So here's an example. Uh, say we wanted to add the number 5.232 and 0 0.31. Uh, real quick, I just want to note, I think I put the number in wrong. Uh, this should give you 5.54 as an answer. Uh, so ignore my math error there. I meant to put 5.54. Uh, but anyway, uh, disregard that for now. So notice the first number, 5.232, has three decimal places. In other words, three digits to the right of the decimal place. The number 0 0.31 has just two decimal places. So your answer should also have only two decimal places. Now you might be asking, why does this matter? Well, if you just took these two numbers and plugged it into your calculator, it would give you 5.542. But that's specifying a digit that we can't say we know for sure. So if we just write down what our calculator said, it's not taking into account sig figs. And so it's not necessarily going to output the most precise number. So our answer, if I did my math right, should be 
five four. Only two decimal places because the number 3.31 only has two. Now, when we multiply and divide two numbers, the general concept is still the same, but we just change one small thing. So when you multiply or divide two numbers in this case, you're going to write your answer with the same number of sig figs as the number that you had earlier with the fewest number of sig figs. So let's just say we want to multiply two random numbers, 3.73 and 2.1. Notice that the number 3.73 has three significant figures, the number 2.1 has only two significant figures. So whatever we get in our calculator and uh, want to write down, we should write our answer with only two sig figs. That being 7.8 in this case. Okay. So now let's talk about writing numbers that are very large and very small. So it is easy for us to write down a measurement of ordinary sized objects. For example, uh, let's just say your height. Maybe your height is 1.72 meters. Well, that's easy enough to write down. Or maybe the weight of an apple is 0.34 pounds. Again, not a complication to write. Uh, but what if you're talking about the radius of a hydrogen atom? Well, that is 0 0.000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
We're going to move over, um, and this is for the diameter of a red blood cell. We're going to move over one, two, three, four, five, six spaces, and put our decimal place there. The remaining number, 7.5, is then multiplied by 10, raised to a negative exponent, since we move to the right, and it's a small number, less than 1, it's a negative exponent. So we get negative 6. So, in other words, the diameter of a red blood cell, which is 0 0.0000075 meters, can be written as 7.5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. Okay, so this just gives us an idea of how to be precise in writing our numbers and how to be concise in writing our numbers in a more compact form if they're too large or too small. So, uh, in our next lecture, what we're going to discuss are units and unit conversions. Uh, we need to discuss conversions because in the United States, many people think in English units, but the rest of the world tends to think in metric units. And so we're going to have to deal with converting between the two. Until then, thanks for watching and have a great day.